Well, welcome to the CMU community uh, and all the alumni out there online. My name is John Nelson, Associate Dean of the Heinz College for Information Systems and Public Policy. Uh, I have a very great pleasure today to welcome two very longtime friends of CMU and of the Heinz College. Uh, first, our moderator, John Delano, the news and politics uh, reporter for KDKA, the local CBS affiliate here in Pittsburgh. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And our guest of honor today, Mr. Paul Mango, a longtime friend of the college also, and uh, author of the new book, Warp Speed, Inside the Operation That Beat COVID, the Critics, and the Odds. We look forward to a very uh, rich discussion today between John and Paul, and I think one that will be very much aligned with uh, the things we do here at Carnegie Mellon, and just a wonderful story about uh, public-private partnership, about a uh, fabulous um, bipartisan effort to, uh, to, to, to combat COVID, and I think it's just very much aligned with a lot of the things we think about and work on here at Carnegie Mellon. So, delighted to have these two gentlemen here today, and without further ado, I'll let them take it away. John, Paul. Thank you. Did you have a question at all? Yeah. Paul, nice to be with you again. Great Hello, everybody. Here. I'm John Delano, and uh, for 25 years, I had the great pleasure of being an adjunct professor at this school. And uh, many, many, many students have passed through my classrooms over the years. And the good news is I still keep in touch with a number of them. And I want you to know every single one, every single graduate is a success story, right? coming from this institution. So I'm happy to be with you all, happy to be with the alumni and students who are streaming online as well. And I'm particularly happy to be with my friend Paul Mango. I first met Paul, oh, I want to say 2017, I think it was, when Paul was a candidate for the Republican nomination for governor of Pennsylvania. And uh, Paul did very well. He was a nobody, frankly. Nobody knew you, right? Yeah. And uh, coming out of the blue, he ended up only losing the primary by some eight points, as I recall. A very close election. He ended up uh, not being the Republican nominee, but of course uh, moved on to some bigger and better things at the, uh, in the United States Capitol, particularly working out of the White House during the Trump administration. We'll come back to some of that in a moment. Uh, but it's uh, great to have uh, Paul here, and particularly to talk about a book that he is I guess it has it been officially published yet? It's out electronically for anyone who has a Kindle or a Nook, but it's uh, the hardcover comes out on May 18th, so May just 18th. a couple weeks so away. About to be out in hardcover. It's a wonderful read. I will tell everybody that if I were still here at the Heinz College teaching, I would require it for the course I taught on public policy and uh, implementation. It is a great book. And a real good, I think, uh, as we will discuss in a moment, a very good example of public-private partnership and working with the private sector to accomplish a goal. So what is Operation Warp Speed? Uh, speed? Well, I want to ask Paul that question, obviously get, get his definition, but just so everybody's on the same page, we're here to talk about an extraordinary accomplishment in the United States which was the development of a vaccine that would protect us all against COVID-19, a development of a vaccine in record speed time, done through government and the private sector, and requiring extraordinary expertise by a number of individuals and cooperation and, uh, uh, frankly, support, both political support as well as the governmental support. Uh, Paul's book outlines the success story, but he also explains some of the warts that came along in this process, and we want to explore some of that. And then if I understand correctly, we can open this up to some questions and comments from uh, those of you here. Uh, so we're going to uh, adhere to a strict timeline and, uh, and begin. So Paul, first of all, thank you again for being with us. Yeah. Um, before I get into the details, what you know, it's not easy to write a book. Why did you want to write this story? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just uh, thank Professor Nelson and uh, Dean Krishnan, who is uh, 
I guess at a, at a tenure granting ceremony, so he couldn't be here. But it's great to be back at the Heinz School. As Professor Nelson said, we've had a great long-term relationship from the time I was at uh, McKinsey, and uh, we just have the greatest respect for the graduates uh, from this program. So thanks for having me. And John, thank you. Uh, several times when I was down in DC, you interviewed me on different topics. I remember Secretary Azar came up to uh, one of the pharmacies here right. to um, revoke the um, <clears throat> gag order. Uh, so in uh, fall of 2018, any time prior to that, when you went to the pharmacy uh, to get a pharmaceutical, the pharmacist could not tell you that there was a better deal than what you were getting. Uh, so we uh, revoked that rule and John came out to the pharmacy, I think it was in Brentwood, and uh, spent some time with yeah. Secretary Azar. That I, was great. I, th I think you gave me a one-on-one -on -one with the Secretary. Yes, I did, an, an exclusive. exclusive. <laughs> yes, we like exclusives at KDKA. <laughs> and then uh, we di you did a nice piece when we were rebuilding the strategic national stockpile. Right. Uh, so thank you for um, amplifying the messages that we're trying to get out to the country and certainly Western Pennsylvania. But um, I, I think I was a reluctant author. Um, there were a number of folks who were encouraging me to do it, and uh, Secretary Azar and I sat down and we decided it'd be easier for me to talk about his role than for he to, him to talk about my role. So uh, that's, that's, uh, it was kind of a coin flip. But uh, I think the real reason is, um, as, as John just mentioned, this is a story that needs to be told so that uh, we can learn both from the great things that happen, but as the book points out, uh, things we would do differently again uh, if we had to do it. And just to take you back for a moment, SARS was in 2003, MERS was in 2012, and then we had COVID beginning in 2019. So the odds that we're gonna have another potential pandemic such as this are probably pretty high. Uh, and I'm hoping that the book uh, will be a reference that uh, folks turn to uh, during the next uh, pandemic. I pulled the president's remarks, President Trump's remarks in December of 2020, uh, which was sort of the, the victory speech yeah. of the accomplishment because the vaccine had been approved, was just on the verge of final approval. And of course, then the distribution, which was another big and important step in this process, was about to happen. But on December 8th, President Trump, December 8th of 2020, uh, shortly after his defeat, he held at the White House a big press event. And I was noting through, as presidents are wont to do, or politicians in general, he goes through all the thank yous. And he starts uh, with uh, Secretary Alex Azar, uh, Health and Human Services Secretary. We're gonna come back and ask you about him in a second. Uh, but he goes through all these names, his 11th Thank you is to Paul Mango. So obviously you made an impression on the president. Tell us exactly what was your role in this whole process of Operation Warp Speed? Yeah, uh, let me just, I'll, I'll convey a, a short anecdote first um, about the president. I was uh, sitting in early February, 15 minutes before kickoff of the Super Bowl. Mm. And I'm down in my media room out in Jackson Hole Wyoming, my phone rings and it's President Donald J. Trump <laughs> saying, uh, hey, Paul, I read the transcript of the book. Um, I really, really like it. And uh, I'm going to make a statement about it. He said, uh, I think it's going to do very well. And he did put out, he eventually put out a statement. But he sent me a personal note afterwards uh, saying basically the same thing. But the only reason I mention that is, um, you know, you have a guy who needs to call a thousand persons a week, right? And someone or he had the presence of mind to reach out and say thank you. So uh, that meant a lot to me. Um, my role was, uh, it was very interesting because effectively Operation Warp Speed was a joint venture between the Department of Defense and Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, obviously, there were other joint ventures like with the private sector and with the states and the public health jurisdictions, but principally, it was uh, those organizations. And interestingly, the Army Chief of Staff, Jim McConville, is my classmate from West Point. Gus Perna, the general who was in charge right. of the Army Materiel Command, who ran all the logistics for Warp Speed, is my year group. 
uh, graduating from school, so we uh, knew a lot of the same officers. And I think uh, Secretary Azar had the wisdom to understand that if this was principally a joint venture between HHS and DOD, and I was in his immediate office anyway, so I could be his representative. You were deputy policy director That's correct. for the department. Yeah, there were three, there was a, there's a group called the immediate office of the secretary, and there were three persons in it. I was one of them. What that means is one of us was with Secretary Azar every minute of the day. So think mm -hmm. about that as 14 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, we'd split up our time. <laughs> But uh, so he needed someone to play the role of uh, representing him on warp speed because we were in the middle of a global pandemic. The guy had a thousand other things to do, as you can imagine. And uh, because I had had that history with the DOD, um, I think he felt it, I would just be his you know, best representative and the liaison uh, to that. And, and John knows about this. I had, I had developed a pretty good reputation with the folks at the White House in rebuilding the stockpile. Uh, so I think all of that just kind of led to, hey, why don't you do this for me? And um, nature took its course. So what did that mean in terms of your own personal day-to-day -day operations? Yeah. We will talk about the different aspects of Operation Warp Speed in a moment. But it really put you in sort of the catbird seat because you had to be engaged with all parts of the government and private sector in the development of this vaccine, yes? Yeah, so the day started at 7 a.m. We'd have um, a, a, a briefing with uh, Secretary Azar at Health and Human Services, which is the Hubert Humphrey building next to the Capitol, adjacent to the Capitol. At 8 a.m., I was over at a meeting in the Roosevelt Room with Jared Kushner every morning because in the COVID response, you had the White House Coronavirus Task Force, which was policy. They developed policy. They deliberated. But Jared and his team made things happen. So when policy came out of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Jared's team said, let's organize the government to get it done. So I'd go to an 8 a.m. meeting over there, brief them on what happened in the prior 24 hours with warp speed. I'd come back, spend my whole day with the Warp Speed team, which was located in our building. Right. DOD had almost 200 persons in, in our building. And then I'd go back over uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because Vice President Pence had a White House Coronavirus Task Force meeting every day, had to brief them. And then I'd come back, and I, I tell people it was only after about 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon that I learned most of what I was going to learn that day by walking around and talking to people in their offices and saying, what else happened today? So um, right. it's amazing what you can learn by walking around a little bit. And then we'd have an out briefing for the secretary around 7, 7.30 at night. And um, so that, that, that was my day for uh, about right. eight months. And just to be clear, the Pence operation was what we all saw. Those were those press conferences. They ended up on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you had all kinds of problems with whether it was, you know, Dr. Fauci or Dr. Birx or somebody saying something or the president talking about taking certain liquids when you shouldn't. I mean, all that kind of stuff. That had nothing to do with your operation or with Operation Warp Speed, right? Intentionally, it did not. Um, it had a totally different purpose, which was, as I said, deliberating and formulating policy on a interagency basis. So you had Department of Labor involved. You had Department of Transportation. Remember, we banned the flights from China. You had Department of State involved. Um, it was a very deliberative body. We could not afford to invest that much time right. in what we were doing. So we sequestered the Operation Warp Speed team over in the Humphrey Building with a completely separate governance structure. So when we needed something, I called Jared. Jared gets the president and says, come on over here in two hours, president makes a decision. So what normally takes weeks, months maybe, in the federal government, we'd get done in hours. And I think that helps explain, from a media standpoint, why we know so, we know so little, or knew so little at the time, yeah. about what you were doing. It was very much behind the scenes, and it was very much out of the public view. And of course, we were really focused on, well, should we be wearing masks or shouldn't we? Or what, you know, you know, what uh, drugs might work to prevent COVID or alleviate COVID? 
we were not focused on a vaccine because everybody had suggested that getting a vaccine was a year and a half, two year operation. Right, Paul? I mean, this yeah. was the, the fact that this happened in about 10 months is pretty remarkable in and of itself. So let me go through some of the stages here. And I'd like you to, if you would, your book is wonderful on telling us about some of the, the cast of characters because there's some pretty amazing people yeah. who were involved in this along the way. Yeah. Names that my, if I were teaching, my class would know because these are, the, these are government and private sector folks who actually accomplish things in government. Yeah. And uh, they deserve to be known. So let, let's start really from the beginning with the development um, of a vaccine. And, and this, of course, is an, uh, I'll let you do the pronunciation of these names because some of them are not easy to pronounce. Um, Monsef Slawi, is that? Correct, the, very good. Uh, tell us a little bit about th the development of a vaccine. How did you folks at the White House and in HHS, and I guess DOD, determine the best way to rapid fire develop a safe and effective vaccine? Yeah. Uh, let me just say a few words about Monsef Slawi because I think if you ask me about Gus Perna, I want to contrast. I will two. ask you about him. <laughs> um, Monsef Slawi was born in Morocco, uh, was educated in Brussels, and came to the United States as an adult because he married an American uh, woman. And I spent the summer of 2021, so last summer, interviewing all of my colleagues from the Operation Warp Speed team, not because I needed to know more about what occurred, but I wanted to know how they were feeling about certain things at certain points in time. Monsef Slaoui is a Democrat. He's a registered Democrat. Monsef, how'd you feel the first time you were in the Oval Office? Those types of things. But the reason I wanted to say a word about Monsef Slaoui is I asked him, I said, Monsef, how'd you ever get involved with vaccines? What, what was your interest? Usually, you know, he's the most successful vaccine developer of our generation, 14 successful vaccines. Most people don't know his name, but that's what he did for his career. Mm -hmm. I said, how'd you get involved with this? He said, my sister died of whooping cough in Morocco and the family made a commitment to making sure that would not happen again or minimize the impact of that happening again. So you had a guy who was absolutely driven to get this vaccine done. By the way, he worked for a dollar he wasn't in it for the money. He worked a year for a dollar. Uh, he was very successful. He didn't need the money, but he made a great sacrifice, a lot of it on behalf of his, uh, of his sister. But getting to the development of the vaccine, this mRNA technology is extraordinary. Uh, Moderna was working on a cancer vaccine with the NIH in January of 2020, before COVID mm -hmm. became present in the United States. And they were working with Tony Fauci's group, uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH. And as soon as the DNA sequence of the coronavirus was published on January 10th of 2020, they collaborated and said, why don't we try using the MRA, mRNA technology to develop a COVID vaccine? It had never been done before. 10 days later on January 20th of 2020, they had a good vaccine. They didn't know it. It hadn't been tested, it hadn't been manufactured at scale, but they had a good vaccine. So actually the science of this was the relative easy part. Mm -hmm. um, BioNTech, which was Pfizer's partner in Germany, shortly thereafter, using the same technology platform, had a good vaccine. Uh, so that, again, we didn't know it, it hadn't been tested, it hadn't gone through clinical trials, but what Moderna had on January 20th, 2020, was the same vaccine it distributed on December 21st, 2020. You folks made the decision, though, not to just go with one vaccine. I believe it was a half dozen. Uh, six. Six. Yeah. And in the press, uh, what happened was as soon as people learned about Operation Warp Speed, there were a number of scientists that said, well, this might be able to be done before the end of the year, but the federal government's going to have to invest in as many vaccines as it possibly can. Now, there were 95 vaccine candidates in April hmm. and May of 2020, all over the world. So Peter Marks from the FDA screened them all and shortened the list to 14. 
But Monsef and Gus Perna, General Gus Perna, got together and they realized that a half a dozen was about the right number. And why is that the case? Because um, the three major technology platforms were covered with two companies each. That made the six. But Gus and his team, so this were, we had a four-star general, a three-star general, a two-star general, a one-star general, about 20 colonels. The significance of this is these guys had been together for decades and they'd been supporting combat operations in the Middle East for 20 continuous years. Right. No one in the world knew more about logistics than this team. And Gus said to Monsef, listen, these vaccines take different sized needles, different uh, size syringes. Uh, the interval between first and second dose is different. Of course, Johnson & Johnson was only one. Uh, they have to be stored at different temperatures. Um, and uh, what that meant was logistical complexity, because in the right. summer of 2020, we didn't know which vaccine was out of the six was going to be a winner. So we had to be prepared for all of them. If we had invested in 10 or 15 or 20, first of all, it would have complicated the clinical trials, because every clinical trial needed a minimum of 30,000 participants. So if you have 20 trials going on, that's 600,000 persons. If you have six going on, it's 180,000, right? So, that was one of our considerations, but there was also a global shortage of raw materials, a global shortage of needles. Uh, we had to procure dry ice. So Gus had a significant influence on Monsef to say, let's limit it to six. And what we did, John, you saw this in the book, we ran a cumulative probability analysis in August of 2020 on the six to say, do we think we can get close enough to victory with only six? And we asked a bunch of experts around manufacturability, will these vaccines potentially be effective in those over age 65? Uh, can they get through the clinical trials fast enough? And what we learned by doing it was we had about a 75% probability in August of 2020 of having at least one safe and effective vaccine manufactured at scale effective in those over age 65 by the end of the year. Yeah. We tested that because there was gonna be potentially one more candidate to seven, which we were willing to go that far. But when we ran it through the cumulative probability analysis, it took us from 75% to 78%. And we said, it's not worth the dilution of management time to invest in that. Right. So. I'm gonna come back to General Gus Perna because he was the distribution man, yeah. the logistics guy, and a phenomenal story about him. Um, but, I, but I think it's important to note that the vaccine development that you engaged in resulted in what I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that certainly the public would say is the best vaccine in the world. Yeah. Better than the Chinese, better than the Russians, and those two countries were out there trying to develop vaccines in order to send them off to undeveloped countries uh, and get credit for that. Um, why did we achieve the best quality vaccine in the United States as opposed yeah. to those other countries? I think just a couple of reasons. Um, I think because we have the best scientists in the world, for starters, in the United mm -hmm. States. The Sinovac vaccine was 50.4% effective. The World Health Organization has a minimum standard of 50%. Uh, so 50.4, one has to be a little bit suspicious about that number. Right. Uh, in contrast, our vaccines were in the 90, 95% effective. So the Sinovac, and you see what's happening in China now, right. anyone who gets it, you might as well flip a coin and say, am I, <clears throat> am I truly uh, protected or I'm not at 50%, basically, right? Uh, ours uh, were significantly higher. I think the second reason is our, um, you know, our regulators, uh, people can argue about the job the Food and Drug Administration did, but I can tell you they did not compromise a single standard uh, uh, on safety and, in fact, mm -hmm. enhanced. These are the safest vaccines ever developed because they went through a, a, a set of standards that was actually more rigorous than most uh, vaccines. Um, and then I think just our ability to manufacture those at scale, the FDA checks every batch coming out of these factories to make sure they right. adhere to that standard. And we had to shut down manufacturing several times because the FDA would not let, fortunately, not let bad product out. So I think it's 
scientists. I think it's um, the commitment to a higher standard and the enforcement of that standard. Yeah. All of which resulted, uh, obviously, in a vaccine that I think most of us are quite comfortable with. Um, the, the whole distribution side, I, I was fascinated. I had never heard of, of Gus Perna. And, uh, or, and, of course, I had never heard of Slowey either, for that yeah, matter. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what's so interesting about your book, is you do go through the cast of characters and tell, tell us a little bit about them. Tell us a bit about uh, Gus Perna, who was responsible for the logistics. And as you pointed out, each of these vaccines required certain different aspects to logistics. But there's, there's a lot more involved as well. But give us a sense of who is yeah. this Gus Perna fellow who was complimented by, again, along with Monsef Slowey, by the president, one of the first two or three names yeah. the president mentioned. So Gus is very self-effacing. Very, both, both Gus and Monsef are humble leaders. Uh, that's the way they grew up for right. decades. And Gus used to say, I'm a C student who works hard. Um, <laughs> that's a way of disarming uh, people. And he's from New Jersey. Uh, had a very unconventional route in the Army because he went to Valley Forge Military Academy, didn't go to West Point, didn't go ROTC, and rose to be one of only 14 four-star generals in the United States Army. So wow. a very... As an enlisted, through the enlistment process. Well, uh, he did get... Uh, Valley Forge has a... They, they grant a degree at the end of that. Okay. So it was... He's a college graduate. Um, but... Uh, I just I think an anecdote that I actually did not put in the book, but I think tells you all you need to know about Gus Perna. We were securing, we had to secure all these 2,000 liter vats to cook the vaccines, if you will. Uh, and they were only manufactured in Germany and Switzerland. Hmm. So you had the army team every day calling around the world and the Swiss said, we have some, we have some here. Uh, we know you guys are, uh, you know, under a lot of pressure. We're going to get them on a boat, and they'll be there in six weeks. And Gus said, I'll have a C-17 there tomorrow afternoon, uh, <laughs> so get ready to load it. And then not only that, this was over Labor Day of 2020. It lands at Newark Airport, and he works with the Department of Transportation and says, I need Interstate 80 shut down for these four hours because this is a double-wide trailer. <laughs> so the point is, though, what Gus would not... He's just a practical, scrappy guy who would not accept six weeks right? and uh, got it done in about 24 hours instead. And that's how the prior record for vaccine development and manufacturing was four and a half years. And for us, as you said, it was 10 months. Well, he had the ability to make things happen yeah. because the president and Jared Kushner yeah. really made it happen. I yeah. mean, it was clear that... Because normally I would assume that there'd be some bureaucrat somewhere who would say, oh, you can't do it that way. You've got to fill out 20 forms. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Sometimes it's good if you break the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. The, the distribution side of this, um, uh, the, well, distribution also means distribution to all of us. But there was so much involved before you got to that stage. Yeah. And indeed, a lot of that stage happened after you folks were out of the administration. And yeah. we'll come back to that in a second, if I may. But in terms of the logistics during 2020, during that year, um, I, you cite the, that example that you did not put in the book, but you have plenty of examples in the book yeah. of where General Perna was just able to make things happen on such a quick basis. Um, but you did have resistance along the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Give us a couple anecdotes of where things, uh, you know, there were both private sector resistance from some of the companies uh, as well as government resistance. Yeah. The, the biggest uh, philosophical disagreement on distribution occurred between the Army Materiel Command folks and the CDC. So the CDC, during the pandemic and during normal course of business, almost on a daily basis is in contact with the public health agencies throughout what's 64 public health jurisdictions in the United States, 50 states, Puerto Rico, 
Solomon Islands, and some big cities are their own public health jurisdictions, believe it or not. New York, Los Angeles, Houston, Chicago, Philadelphia, actually, in the, in the Commonwealth here. And um, so the CDC had this orientation toward the public health infrastructure, and it wanted the public health organization to be the primary points of distribution and vaccine administration. But there were a couple of real issues with that that Gus and the team recognized. First of all, the public health agencies were, even by this time, absolutely overwhelmed, uh, burned out, uh, employees leaving. This was already 10 months into the pandemic. Second, uh, just, a, just a small story about the difference in capabilities. Uh, one of our biggest concerns was getting people back for their second dose. Right. So on average, if you take all the vaccines in the country, only about 70% of Americans come back for a second dose or more. So we were very concerned about this. So in working with CVS, one of our private sector partners, what they insisted upon, which we thought was great from a behavioral science standpoint is, if you're gonna make your first appointment, if you're gonna make your appointment for your first shot, we're not gonna let you get that first shot unless you simultaneously make the appointment for your second right. shot. So it's a lot easier you know, from a status quo bias to not make a second appointment than to cancel, to cancel one you've already made. The public health organizations had no capability to do that. There was no electronic scheduling. There was certainly no electronic rescheduling. So for us, it was a very easy decision. It also meant you had to hold dosages back. Yes. And that caused an issue for that, some. Yeah, that was um, so... Pfizer is a, is a totally different story, but the way it worked with Pfizer was we had an advanced purchase agreement for 100 million doses, but they only got paid when those doses left the warehouse. Okay? So um, we made a commitment to the American people that said, if you come in for your first dose, we guarantee you your second dose will be available, which meant in the early weeks, we had a hold. Uh, that second dose in the warehouse because the manufacturing stability did not exist yet. It was very erratic. And we could have canceled the whole batch. The FDA could have precluded a whole batch of five million doses going out. And we didn't know that week to week early on. So um, we held, so I think um, Pfizer had about eight million doses available on day one. We shipped out four right away and held four until the next week's uh, manufacturing shipment came in. But they were beating us up in the, in the media because uh, the states were begging for more and Pfizer said, well, we have all these in our warehouse. We don't know why the Operation Warp Speed team isn't shipping them out. Uh, well, we had a very good reason and we had to spend a lot of time communicating that. Um, but the, uh, I think overall where we wound up was we had 70,000 wound up with 70,000 vaccine outlets across the United States. Uh, going back to CVS, they hired 25,000 new employees to conduct vaccinations. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the public health agencies, we just couldn't see uh, doing that. But that in and of itself was a bit of a dispute. Um, if I can interrupt on yeah, that, please. because I, I mean, I had mine, I have the Moderna vaccine, yeah. and I got it, I think it was through Rite Aid. And the fact that you folks made a decision to use private sector pharmacies, in my view, was brilliant. Yeah. Because I think they actually, we have relationships with our pharmacies. They're in the neighborhoods. Yeah. Now, we had that horrible crunch. I remember going online, maybe some of you may as well, and you kept trying to get an appointment. And it took forever. You just had to keep trying and trying and trying. Yeah. That eased after a couple months. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was no doubt going into 2021 that it was just a whole lot easier to go to a pharmacy to get your shot yeah. than to figure out where's the public health building in Allegheny County, yeah. you know. That, that would have been crazy. Right. But you got resistance on this decision, right? Yeah, yeah from, the, from the CDC. And at the core of it was um, they were asking for $6 billion dollars to distribute to the public health agencies so that they could build the capability to distribute and administer the vaccines. And we said, 
money is not really the rate limiting factor. It's all the other capabilities. If we distributed that money, there's still COVID money that hasn't been spent, by the way, for, for two years. Right. If we distributed all that money, that doesn't mean they can hire the employees, develop the IT systems, expand their reach. It just couldn't be done. So um, we wound up insisting uh, that we would go with the private sector. And I think, it, as you said, it worked out very right. well. Now, there has been some distribution through public sector yeah. Oh, through, yeah. They were part of it. And, the like. but and all the federally qualified health centers and hospitals. Yeah. So right. they weren't excluded. They just weren't the exclusive uh, distribution right. agent. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is another another reason why this is a great example of private public yeah. partnership, because in the end, the private distribution, well, the private development yeah. of the uh, of the vaccine distribution was mostly public side, it would seem to me. In that, in that you were using military or using DOT or some other form of governmental trans, transit, well, although maybe you had private as well. Did yeah, you use yeah, so, UPS and FedEx yeah, so, were involved? Um, I, I put a, one of the things I put in the book is, with very few exceptions like the Department of Defense vaccinating its own soldiers and so forth, not a single federal employee touched a dose of vaccine before it was injected into Americans' arms. Mm -hmm. It went from factory to McKesson as a warehouse to UPS to FedEx and then out into the market. So right. technically we never touched it. And we had this principle that was very important to the public private partnership, John, which was um, the, the federal government should never engage in any activity the private sector can do better. Yeah. Right. Let me ask you, I'm going to ask two questions and I want to open this up so we have time. Um, folks at the Heinz College might be interested in Tiberius. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, you know, most of us, I'm a historian by background, that was my major. Yeah. You think of the emperor Tiberius. Yeah, right. And uh, that's not what this is all about. This no. is computer focused stuff. Yeah. Tell us exactly what was Tiberius and how important was it in this process of vaccine yeah. development and distribution? Um, so uh, it was vital. Um, so again, let's come back to Gus Perna. Um, he said to his to all of us very early on in the summer of 2020, I need to see what's going on on my battlefield all the time. That was the <laughs> premise for this. So Palantir was the uh, vendor we used. And what Palantir did was it linked us into every factory. So we knew what was happening and not just the vaccine factories, but things like vials uh, were being manufactured by Corning. We needed to know on an integrated logistics basis, what was happening. They had a link to every uh, pharmacy, every hospital, because you couldn't, the way the, the program worked was, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would have to authorize that Rite Aid could be a, 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 a vaccinator. Right. And then we would hook them into the IT system. Uh, he, they linked in UPS, FedEx, everyone, so that on any given day, we could tell any governor precisely what was happening with their vaccines, where they went, how many were used, how many were left, because every week they were gonna get a new allocation and they needed to know what, what is my current status before I now tell the federal government, this is where I want next week's doses going. And we used it, there was a thing, uh, an entity called the Vaccine Operating Center, and I, in the book I talk about it as, think about Houston Control, monitors all over, uh, on the walls and anyone who walked in could see what was happening because we were getting a GPS signal every two minutes from every vaccine container going out every day. So we knew precisely where it was and we knew who signed for it and we actually knew the temperature of the container because right. it had to be maintained at minus 80 degrees. And just a, a small aside, there were things called temperature excursions, that's the official term, where the temperature was not maintained at minus 80 but it never got warmer, it always got colder. I don't understand the physics of that or the chemistry, <laughs> but it would go to like minus 90 degrees Celsius and the FDA looked into it very quickly and said that's not gonna harm the vaccines only if they're warmer, not if they're colder. Right. Uh, so um, this was a, a vital information technology and decision support system uh, that gave us line of sight into everything that was happening every day and we hired uh, 64 contractors and we put them out into each of the public health jurisdictions with a terminal 
so that they could actually operate it on behalf of the, of the jurisdiction so that we didn't have to train anyone how to use it. But if the governor right. said, I want to know what happened last week, someone would type it in and show them in five seconds. Who developed Tiberius? It was Palantir. Palantir. Yeah, Palantir. Yeah. So they must have had a number of whiz kids. Yeah, I mean, and this they is were, a comp. You're, yeah. you're tying together lots of information from a gazillion yeah. sources. Yeah, and a lot of them antiquated government systems too. Well, that was. I'm sure that was why you yeah. went private sector. Yeah. Well, but they had to even link some of the legacy government systems together, which was not easy. Right. Yeah. We may come to that in a second. Yeah. Um, it, it may be reflected in one of the questions I have here. Let me ask my last question before we move to these. Um, politics. Yeah. You're no stranger to politics. No. You were a candidate for governor. You know what politics is all about. Let me just ask the point blank question. How many times did President Trump tell you you had to have this vaccine out before the November election? Yeah, not once. Um, so we met every three. Not th once. Not once, no. Never. Never. Did Jared Kushner tell you? No, never. Did Alex Azar, the secretary, tell you? No. Did anybody at any time in any place out of the White House tell you that this vaccine needed to be out and about before the election? No, no one did. Did that yeah. su surprise you? Not really. I mean, uh, I, one of the things I wrote in the book is interesting. Every time we met with the president and briefed him on vaccines, his first question was, how about therapeutics? And he told us a story. He had four of his close friends die of COVID. And his logic was pretty compelling. He said, um, there's no vaccine that's perfect. So there's always going to be infections and, and people hospitalized, even if they're vaccinated. Right. But I think what most Americans want to know is, if I wind up in the hospital, can I be cured? And uh, so <laughs> somewhat interestingly, he was much more interested in therapeutics than he was in the vaccines. And of course, in October of 2020, he contracted COVID and he got the Regeneron monoclonal antibody, which he would claim saved his life. Right. So, uh, and he said this long before that. So uh, I think he was right in many ways. So with respect to the politics, you did have some interaction with the Biden administration as it was coming in. Yeah. Um, and I know in your book, you write that you were not happy at some of the criticism. I don't know whether the president, President Biden himself criticized, but certainly staff people or some of his people yeah. were critical. Um, tell us a little bit about what hurt the most. Yeah. So um, a couple things. Uh, one of the th when a trend when a transition takes place between administrations, there's a term they use called landing teams. So what that is, is the new administration embeds uh, a, a whole bunch of a team in every cabinet department. So we're in the Hubert Humphrey building. We set aside a whole floor basically right next to the vaccine operating center, scores of cubicles, conference rooms, everything else. Mm -hmm. They never showed up, not once. Now, did we have Zooms and everything else? Yes, we did. We had plenty of those. Um, the day of January 20th, 2021, inauguration day, the, the day after that, so January 21st, his team was quoted in the paper as saying uh, three things. Uh, they left us a mess. We had to start from scratch, and they had no plan. And as uh, political appointees, we just said that's politics. They're lowering the bar so they can look good. But the real issue was there were about 300 individuals, career officials in the Humphrey building at that time mm -hmm. who were seven days a week, you know, 16 hours a day working to get this done. And guess what? They continued on. They, they were, you know, they're career officials. So they stayed with the new administration. And um, you can imagine the morale impact of your new boss basically saying, uh, you guys didn't do anything the last 10 months. And I talked to a lot of them. Uh, I used to check in with them every couple weeks. Um, and, you know, they were a little bit at risk in talking to me after I left the government, but they said morale is just terrible. Um, 
because everything is centralized at the White House now. They're not letting us make decisions. And they criticized everything we did. So just, I write in the book, it's just a lack of executive presence. Forget about Paul Mango and Alex Azar and everyone else who left the government. They're just political appointees. They know what politics is about. But uh, it, had a, it had a deep impact on the team that was left there and, you know, all the Army right. guys in particular. But you also acknowledge that ultimately the Biden administration followed your game plan. Yeah. And uh, it, yeah. so, you know, <laughs> imitation is the highest <laughs> form, form of flattery, flattery. right? And, and just to be fair, they did a spectacular job of picking up the ball and running with it um, and getting America vaccinated. Yeah. Uh, I think we had 25 million shots at the end of January and by uh, when we left, basically, and they had 200 million by, you know, the end right. of the spring. Not easy. Right. As a political analyst, I can see the dilemma they were in because Joe Biden had run against Donald Trump on his incompetence of dealing with COVID. Yeah. And I don't know that it was so much the vaccines. I don't think the vaccines were a focus at all of, of the, the Biden attack. It was, it was some of the crazy stuff Trump would say at these press conferences that were nuts. And, you know, uh, and I think that that was the focus. So yeah. here they come into power and they can't automatically turn around the dime and say, hey, by the way, Trump was nuts on this stuff, but he actually did a great job on the vaccine. That would have been really tough for them to do. Yeah. I think ultimately the fact that they did follow your game plan in the end uh, is what made a difference. Um, we've got lots of great questions. Some of these I had already had on, on my list, but let me just take them from here. So uh, as I watch our time, because I think we, uh, we adjourn promptly at uh, the top of the hour, right? So here's a question. And I think you address part of this in your book as well. With hindsight, what one or two things do you wish Operation Warp Speed had done? Yeah, differently. Yeah, yep. done differently. One is we had zero excess vaccine manufacturing capacity in the United States in the spring of 2020. So um, the level of frenetic activity that went into finding that, you know, equipping it, as I said, and so forth, was uh, the, the most harrowing part, if you will, of Operation Warp Speed. So we can't let that happen again. And there's ways to ensure you have, quote, warm capacity waiting. And sure, it costs a little bit of money, but um, in the long run, that was uh, the area where we had the least confidence uh, was, was manufacturing. I also talk in the book about the federal government's lack of a social media presence. So, um, yeah, I thought that was very insightful. Yeah. Um, amplify that a little bit. Yeah, so I got, before I was working for Secretary Azar at, uh, up, up at the department, I was the chief of staff at CMS, and I had just come off the campaign using social media, right? CMS is yeah, the Center, Center for, for Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services. And uh, one of the things that they do every year is send out these little booklets to uh, pamphlets or whatever to Medicare recipients <laughs> showing them their benefits and what's changed and everything else. And I said, that seems pretty inefficient to be sending out 60 million of these things. Don't we have a way to deliver it electronically? And what's our social media presence? Can't we post it? And uh, so I did a little digging. And I think most people know for seniors, the most popular social media platform is, anybody know? Facebook. Facebook, by Which far. Which I hate. So, um, so at sorry, the time. sorry, that was caught on camera. <laughs> <laughs> this was in uh, the summer of 2018, and um, we had 60 million Medicare beneficiaries, and we had 400,000 Facebook followers. So that gives you a sense for how under 400,000 out of 60 million. Out of 60 million. And um, it, it's not just to distribute information, but it's what I call social listening. What, what are people chattering about out there? What are they saying about the vaccines? Or are they concerned right. about quality or safety or whatever? Uh, zero presence. And then the last thing I talk about in terms of doing it differently is, and it's a broader statement on COVID response, we had the best virologists and the best epidemiologists in the world working on the White House Coronavirus Task Force at the CDC you know, Bob Redfield's probably the world's most renowned virologist. We didn't have a single behavioral scientist. And if you think about mm -hmm. COVID and mitigating the spread, 
and protecting the American people, it was 100% behavior. Uh, did you wear your mask? Did you isolate? Did you socially distance? And did you get your vaccine? Every one of those is a individual behavior. We didn't have a single behavioral scientist. So, and, and Secretary Nazar and I put out a message to the department, do we have any behavioral scientists out of our 85,000 employees? Zero, yeah. not one. So uh, I think we have to invest in that next time around. Well, I'm gonna inject my own question. It was one of the ones I'd thought about precisely because of that comment, which has to do with the fact that we would have a debate over whether to get vaccinated or not. And I think you touch on that in your, in your book. Um, but it's crazy. I mean, we all know we've 90 plus percent vaccinate their kids. Uh, and it's yeah. not just because it's required by schools, because there are always exceptions. But we, we don't question whether a child should be vaccinated against whooping cough. Yeah. Because we know that's going to kill them if they get it or has the potential. Well, COVID can kill too. And yet we're having this debate over whether to be vaccinated or not. And I'm just wondering if, why are we having this debate? Is it because politics got in the middle of all this somewhere along the line? Is it because we didn't have behavioral sciences, scientists who are helping us figure out how to sell the product? Was, and I know some of this happened under your watch, but also some of it was happening under yeah. President Biden's watch. Yeah. It just seems like we did, we, if there was a failure, that was another failure. That was a big failure. And um, we um, received $300 million in uh, September of 2020 for the purpose of communicating to the American people about the vaccine. And we were really torn because uh, we were concerned about two things. One is we'd get everyone excited about a vaccine coming, that it's gonna be safe and effective. And then the FDA in December would say, nah, you don't have a vaccine. And at some point you have to be a little bit careful in the, in the government. Uh, I think both presidents have been criticized about this. I, I, I'm not saying it's fair, but they've been criticized. If they make a public statement about a vaccine, about a therapeutic, someone comes and says, you're trying to influence the FDA. Mm -hmm. So if we went out there with messages about these will be safe and effective vaccines, it's almost second guessing the regulatory. So you had agency. to essentially hold the public notification process until the FDA acted, which was really at the very end of the process. <laughs> and then we were shipping the next day. The second concern we had was mm -hmm. if everyone was really excited about getting a vaccine, we knew we weren't going to have 300 million on the first day. So, and that's exactly what happened. There was much more demand than supply. Right. And people were frustrated. Just like you said, you tried how many times to make an weeks. appointment at, at, at weeks. Rite Aid. So we decided not to go big in that area. We, we probably could have done something, but those were our uh, concerns. And, um, right. you know, again, uh, you'd have to think through whether or not that was the right decision. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure it was. Yeah. Let but me the, move political, to the political environment was the real downfall yeah. of it on both sides. I agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, let's move through these a little quickly. Yeah. Could you describe the relationship with Pfizer a little more? Yeah. Um, your book is very interesting because it seemed like you had a good relationship with Moderna, but Pfizer, uh, not so yeah. great. Uh, let me see. It's probably... Uh, similar to a lot of marriages, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> can't live with them, can't live without them. Right. Um, now, I would say, first of all, let me say Pfizer did a spectacular job on behalf of the American people, and I don't want to take anything away from them. But boy, were they difficult to work with uh, on multiple uh, dimensions. But the most significant one, I'll just go through this quickly. I have the contract at home. Um, they pledged to deliver to us 20 million doses in November of 2020, 20 million in December, and then 20 million each of the first three months of 2021. So 100 million doses. Every other vaccine manufacturer, we had uh, teams out in their factories every day so that when they encountered a problem in manufacturing, they'd call, our team would call back and we would take care of it right away. Need raw materials, need spare parts, need laborers, whatever it is, we'll use the Defense Production Act, we'll get it taken care of in 24 hours. Pfizer didn't permit us to put anyone into their factory in Kalamazoo. 
all right, fine. You guys think you know what you're doing. That's great. But then they didn't deliver on the 40 million. They, only, they delivered none in November and a total of 18 million in December. So they were less than half of their commitment. And you say, okay, we understood that everyone has manufacturing problems, but when you didn't let us into your plant. Right. And then poor Gus Perna, because of course all the governors were clamoring for, how many are we gonna have? How many doses are we gonna have? We need to plan. Can I get all my frontline healthcare workers vaccinated? Can I get my nursing home folks vaccinated? So Gus put out a number based on what Pfizer gave him, and then mm -hmm. Pfizer doesn't deliver, and they didn't let us into their plants. So that was, from an Operation Warp Speed team perspective, inexcusable. Right. Uh, there also seemed to be a CEO issue there, yeah. as I recall. Yeah. The CEO was, of Pfizer was not happy with President Trump, and frankly, he wouldn't be with President Biden. They both want Pfizer to reduce their drug prices, yeah. generally. Yeah. And he didn't like that idea. No, he didn't like that at all. <laughs> so, um, if our overall response to COVID were a test, how did America do? A, B, C, D, A plus, B plus? Um, first of all, I think the jury's still out. Again, I watch Fair. what's happening in China. What China did was move its curve to the right. That's all it did. If you see what's happening in Shanghai and Hong Kong right now, they think they can escape this, the, the transmission of this virus. It's almost impossible. Um, I think I would give us a, around a C minus. Um, and the reason I say that is we had one of the highest case fatality rates in the world. Um, but we also, uh, I, I think, only moderately damaged the long-term, you know, lo learning loss for kids in school, economy shut down. A lot of other countries went much further than we did. And this is my, my biggest beef, is that public health has to balance the spread of a virus with all of the other public health issues. Opioid overdose, like I said, learning loss. People, uh, I was watching the Medicare numbers in early 2020, cancer screenings declined by 90%. Yeah. Because no one wanted to go in for anything. So if you don't balance the public health issues over here with COVID, uh, then you have a situation where we're gonna be dealing with, for a very long time with some intractable issues. I don't think it's as bad as other countries, so I, that's why I'd give us a C, but we need to do a lot better next time. That was the overall COVID. Yeah. What about Operation Warp Speed? What grade would you give that? I, I would give it, um, I wouldn't give it an A plus. I, I'd probably give it an A minus. Um, and I think some of the things we talked about right. with communications, the decisions we made, I think we would have done that differently. But um, I mean, I just two, two things that came out. The Commonwealth Fund came out in December of 2021, so just a couple of months ago, and said uh, Operation Warp Speed prevented 1.1 million deaths in the United States in the first year. And then the Council of Economic Advisors said it also, in the first six months, precluded $1.6 trillion of economic loss. Mm -hmm. So against those standards, you know, A, a minus is, is pretty good. Yeah, good. <laughs> Two quick last questions. Yeah. Uh, this one we sort of touched on. Do you think the reluctance of some people to get the vaccine was due to the sheer speed at which the vaccine was developed and a suspicion about that? I will say that when I'm out and about, you know, you still get, it's an emergency use authorization. It was never, it hasn't been finalized. I don't want to yeah. take a vaccine that's not been finalized. Do you think that was part of the reluctance? I do. do. And the irony of that is um, Alex Azar coined this Manhattan Project too. Yes. And a few people said, Geez, Mr. Secretary, uh, well, Manhattan Project One actually wound up killing a lot of people. We're trying to save a lot of folks. Uh, <laughs> so that may not be the best name. And then uh, the person who came up with uh, Operation Warp Speed was a Star Trek um, groupie, uh, Peter Marks, who, again, the irony of it is he runs the Center for Biomedical Evaluation and Research, which is the part of the FDA that approves the vaccines. And um, that name stuck, but we did have some regrets about that afterwards because our intent was to 
was to express a sense of urgency, as you can imagine. Right. But of course, you know, people receive that message differently, like, oh, they're going to cut corners. Yeah. The reality of the situation is the standards, as I mentioned earlier, were actually higher uh, for these vaccines than any other. But that was, that was difficult once the name caught on. Final question to Paul Mango. When someone in Hollywood finally buys the rights to Operation Warp Speed, yeah. who would you like to see play Paul Mango? You know, in the folks movie? have um, folks have already inquired about uh, doing a uh, movie, and uh, I was thinking George Clooney, but uh, <laughs> we'll have to see. We both have some gray hair now. <laughs> Good choice. Good yeah. choice. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a big round of applause for Paul Mango. Appreciate it.